I was a Bible thumper Jesus freak when I was growing up. Um, I went to a Baptist church from the time I was six years old to the time I was 18. And um, at that time, um, I was one of these people who kind of a little bit self-righteous. I Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was a little self-righteous and I kind of thought, you know, my family was perfect and everybody else was sinners. Hi. And um, so I even remember writing a paper about Beavis and Butthead and I wasn't allowed to watch MTV. And the only music I really had was Alvin and the Chipmunks and Christian music. But here I was writing a paper about Beavis and Butthead and how bad it was. And I was just parroting stuff that I heard from the pulpit. I didn't have any, any actual. Yes, can hear you. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Third time try. Um, so my come to Jesus moment was in the 10th grade when I went to St. Vincent West Indies and we were building a vacation Bible school there. And I remember um, sitting on the porch with the missionary with all my friends and, um, you know, feeling self-righteous about ourselves, you know, how what great we were and giving ourselves pat on the backs. And we see some kids down below and the missionary tells us not to feed them or they will bring their friends. And I just looked at him and was like, what do you mean? Why can't I feed them? Why aren't we feeding these people who are in a third world country and are hungry? Why are we putting so much money into a vacation Bible school and giving them glitter and craft projects? Because that was my, my role was the craft, the craft teacher. And it's like, why are we doing that and not just feeding them? And then through that fellowship, we'd have that fellowship through the food. Um, so that was sort of like when the, um, the shiny exterior started to crack, you know, I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't get this. And I started to realize that my family wasn't as perfect as I thought. And in fact, there was a lot of cracks there too. And um, then in senior year, I, I thought I met the love of my life and he ended up being a pathological liar. Yay. And I was really gullible and innocent at the time and didn't know any better. And so um, I ended up going to the college I went to. It was a local college because I thought we were just going to get married and, you know, we, I would just stay close. And um, since all that happened and I found out, you know, he was a jerk. Um, I decided to be the player, you know, I was tired of being played. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to be the player. I'm not gonna have anything to do with God. I'm going to play men, you know, have these one night stands, whatever. And, um, you know, I wasn't gonna call myself a Christian cause I was definitely wasn't, wasn't going to be doing anything that was Christian. <laughs> and yeah, so I ended up, um, getting embraced by the senior of uh, theater. I was a pre-major when I went into college and they they liked me. And so they brought me in and, you know, I, I learned all about the theater world and um, did the LARPing because it was it was it was costumes and you know it was theater but it was improv is basically improv theater and um, you know I was really into that and it was interesting because after we did the LARP we would have our parties and then in the kitchen where everybody gathered God would come up and it's like what in the world why are we talking about God we just role played vampires why are we talking about God now and you know I didn't want anything to do with God and it was interesting because you know, through, through my life as at college, God kept um, coming up and it wasn't like I was trying to force him or anything. He just, these conversations just naturally happened. Um, I got busted. And I, I said this before, um, if you've read the, if you saw the podcast with, um, let's just talk about religion, not be assholes about it. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, got busted. Uh, I was doing a, a theater. Uh, I wrote my notes. <laughs> I was doing a theater convention, a flying convention that um, that lasted several weeks. And I, I was living in a dorm at the time and it was during the summer. So I needed some place to stay. And my mother arranged it for me to stay at a lady, um, one of the ladies at our church. She was a couple ages, a couple years older than me. No, because you'll have to, <laughs> I didn't miss out on anything, but um, so she was, uh, she was this really diehard Christian and I would wake up in the morning and there would be Bible verses on the, on the bed, on the floor, or on the ceiling, on the wall, in the shower, you know, everywhere I went, it was just happy sunshine, everything. And I was like, Oh my, I need to get out of here. I can't take this. So my friends in the flying convention, they're like, Hey, you know, we have an apartment. You can stay with us. I was like, that's awesome. So thing was, they were two men. <laughs> and so I was staying there pretending that I was staying at the other, the other place. And I got busted um, by my parents, <laughs> my mom, and my sister, actually. And so I ended up having to go to church camp or else I, it was like one of those ultimatums, go to church camp or we're going to take everything away from you. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm at church camp. And it was there that they were doing that. Um, you know, they had come to get, there was like a Bible boot camp that was happening and it was like a world boot camp and um, all the people from all over the world had gathered. And um, 
you know, that moment that I always talked about before where they were all singing this song and all in their language. And it was just so beautiful. And it was just such a moment. And it was sort of like there that was like, hmm, this is very interesting. And it was almost like, you know, starting to come back a little bit into God. Um, and then I started reading that, like, I, I, I liked TJ, TG Jakes at the time. And I know my mom was like constantly sending me stuff. And so I liked TG Jakes and I, that women now aren't loose. I really like that. And that's before TG Jakes started, you know, really being famous. Um, but I really like that. And so that was starting to bring me back. And so I started looking for a church because, um, you know, I, I was like, okay, let me, let me try this again. So I started looking for a church and, you know, I trying all different denominations and they just felt like it was a business. Like people were more interested in bringing in more people. And that was a problem at my old church was they became too big. So it just felt like, you know, that was happening, that they were trying to grow their church and you know, they were going to lose sight of fellowship and they were just looking to convert numbers and they were just bringing in more people. And um, I went to one, it was like a non-denomination. And I think this was in Cincinnati. And um, it was like a fashion show. They did a Mother's Day, but it was a fashion show for Mother's Day. And it was so much spectacle. And I, I was in theater, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. But it had nothing to do with anything. It was just a spectacle, you know, they didn't tie it into any kind of lesson or anything like that. And so I gave up. <laughs> I had like my checklist of churches and I just, I couldn't find any and I gave up. And, um, so, you know, that I, we, I was, I was now connected back to God, you know, and I still had like conversations with him and everything. And I was still finding him like through books and, and occasionally through, um, a te, uh, one of those, um, televangelists, but not the big famous ones, more of the ones that were not well and well known. And, um, you know, I was starting to phase back into it. Um, but growing up in a small town and everyone knew my business, you know, that, that was just the thing in the Appalachian mountains, everyone just knew your business. And so I always had that thing about what would people think, what would people think? And, um, and I was always worried about offending someone. So, um, that made me, um, a perfect doormat for, um, everything. Cause I was also a workaholic and I loved helping people succeed. So even though I, I wasn't, you know, so much a diehard Christian in that aspect anymore. I still had that, that idea of, um, you know, wanting people to be better, you know, seeing, seeing the good things in other people and, and, and wanting to pull that out. And, um, I was working pro bono marketing for a dance studio and, um, you know, cause I love the arts and I really wanted to support it. And I found that marketing was sort of like, a, a way for me to do all the things with theater, but not so expensive. So I was helping them out and I, in order to do that, I wanted to be able to understand exactly what I was marketing. So I took burlesque, I took belly dance, I took hoop dance, I did the hoops with the fire. You know, I did all the fun stuff and I, um, and I, classes, which was cool. And the burlesque class, the burlesque class was like 10 weeks. And that was so fun. And I was like, well, this is costumes, but it wasn't just costumes. It was empowerment for women because here I am this little, you know, I grew up in the, in the country girl and, you know, always wondering about, worried about what people think. And here I am as a burlesque dancer now. And one of the requirements was for the graduation is we had to perform, do a whole routine, you know, down to the pasties um, on stage. <laughs> so talk about getting rid of any kind of intimidation that you have or worrying about what people think. And I remember being up on stage and just feeling so much empowerment, you know, it's like, here's the command of the audience. And this is amazing. And, you know, everyone watching you and it was just like, this is really cool. And it's like an interplay of um, the human and the costumes, but it also has a little routine that has a story number and it's all about soliciting an emotional response. And so it was everything that, you know, I liked about theater and, um, and for shy girl like me, it really kind of brought me out of my shell. Now with that experience, I had been working at a factory. Um, I had been working many different jobs because being a theater artist, I was doing like my passion on the side on top of my bread and butter job. So my bread and butter job was the factory job. And at, um, at the time, I think I was working at customer service and I was customer service. I was also VIP for, Mar uh, for the special, um, special customers. I was um, setting up brand new accounts and vetting new customers. I was also email hub for the entire factory because it was so old. Um, they didn't trust like customer service to deal directly with the customers. So they had to go through me and then I had to kind of funnel out. So all emails came through me and then I had to figure out which department got what. And for the international customers, I took care of all of those. And I used Google um, Translate to be able to translate to their, uh, those customers in their own language. And um, and this is what I did for like six years. Um, 
And then I would also help customers. I would answer the phone. I would do phone orders all at the same time. So I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm on email. I'm setting up brand new accounts and betting. I'm doing special projects for the owner and the vice president, um, the president and vice president, who are basically the owners. Their parents owned it, but they, they were technically the owners. And um, then I was also working, you know, pro bono marketing for the dance company. I was doing costume design. I was a um, residential costume designer for the theater around here. And I was just busy. I worked basically from eight in the morning till 2 a.m. at night. <laughs> just, I think I had a couple breaks. And that, I loved it because I was a workaholic, you know, it was, I absolutely loved it. And it was, a, it was how I was able to do my passion is I had to do all this other stuff, but I wasn't getting a lot of pay. Like um, the theater stuff was basically three months for $300 with volunteer contracts. It was, it was a dollar a day. Um, the pro bono marketing was for free and the um, customer service, I was making nine twenty five an hour. So I wasn't making a lot of money at all, but I was doing a lot of work. And then um, I got in a wreck I was willing way too much. And I had actually just started my job as an adjunct instructor. So another part-time job. And I had gotten in a wreck that day. And um, it sort of was like my, oh my goodness, I need to cut down because I'm on autopilot. And what's interesting about that is that my dad had gotten me a car. Um, I had been driving a 14 year old car and my dad decided like for my birthday, he was going to buy me a car. He just had like this feeling he needed After that, I got into a wreck where I got T-boned at the driver's side. And had I not had this type of car I had, which was top of the line to make a lot of today, I would. Um, so I decided to phase phase out a lot of the stuff I was doing. I was um, trimming it all down. Uh, the burlesque had given me such confidence that I went to my boss and I gave him an ultimatum. And I said, either promote me or I'm out of here. Because the design position had opened up. That's what I wanted. And the designer had finally, I mean, she had retired. I was like, great. I was like, I want that, promote me or I'm out of here. And they're like, well, she's staying on part-time and she's going to keep that position. I was like, what are you, what? <laughs> when are these people leaving? So I was like, well, give me something or else I'm out of here. And I had made myself so valuable at that company, I could do that. And that was during the recession because I came in in 2006 and this was at um, 2012 that I had made this. So we were right in these recession and I'm saying this and I made myself so valuable that they're like, okay, you can have the marketing. And there was no marketing department. They made that for me. They gave me my own office. Everything was going great. It took me a year to kind of get um, out of there. I had like five micromanagers, five bosses. And then finally I got their trust. And that next year I was in full control. It was, I think it was 2015. I was in full control of everything. I brought in the makeup and hairstylist um, for a photo shoot. I was the one who chose them. I got to do a wig for the photo shoot. Um, the entire catalog was research that I had done. The legacy of the company that went all the way back to the beginning was in that catalog. I named every single costume in that catalog because I had a marketing campaign for that next year around it. And that is when those investors, and, and, and it was interesting because like three weeks prior to that, because it's like, well, this is not design, but it's marketing. And, I, and you know, it could be fun. But I'm like, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go and I'll do whatever you want me to do. Cause everyone prays that, you know, and it was just like, okay, I just want to make sure three weeks later, the investors come in, they shut down the, they, they, they fire almost everybody in the factory that next day after they get controlling interest. And a week later, there's five of us and we're all gone. <laughs> just like that. I had an inheritance. I had financial approval for a house that I was going to get. We were going to look at that house the very next day. And my entire life just went phew, gone. I was no longer working the other jobs. I had phased them down. I went from all those jobs to, no, it wasn't legal. It was not legal. And this is how I know so much that I know now because of that experience. And um, if you listen to my journey, on um, my journey into the world of fraud on here, I'll tell you the whole story, but I'm not gonna go into details on this, but it was not legal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was my experience. So everything that I had built and everything that I had allowed myself to be exploited because I wanted the design, but I was okay with marketing. Everything that I had worked hard for was gone in a week. I had no warning. Nobody did. And so here I was laid off and I was like, oh, there's no way I'm going to be that long employed. Nobody wanted to hire me. I couldn't get anyone to, I couldn't get past the vetting process. I couldn't even get an interview. And so 
I um, ended up going back to school. I was like, okay, well, I'll find out. Maybe I could figure out a law or something or, or make this so that it can't happen to somebody else. So I went back to school to study as a paralegal. And since I was um, an adjunct instructor, I was able to take three classes at that community college at the same time. So I was like, this is perfect. So I could get this um, another uh, degree, CSC, um, for free since I was working as an adjunct um, at that school. Um, so that next year I got pregnant and which was great because we tried to have a baby before in 2013, I had a miscarriage. So it was like, my body was finally at a point where I could handle it. Cause I think I was just doing way too much to even be able to carry a kid. My, my body was so stressed. Um, so I ended up having a baby and that was great. Um, but, and I was doing temp jobs at that time. Well, six months after I have her, and I and I did have a medical crisis. And if you go to SoundCloud, redesign your thinking, um, healthcare repair, I will tell you that whole story. I was, yeah, I had something that only one in five people in the world had, and I found out when I was pregnant. And so we ended up going through five different insurance companies in that same year, and we met our deductible, and then it went back to zero. So <laughs> I'm just glad we had our inheritance because I don't know what we would have done because um, that's where that money went. And so I just had a baby. I was, you know, working temp jobs for about six months. My husband lost his job. He was medical transplant, um, trans, transport. His business went through a lot of weird stuff to eventually the owner killing himself and then getting bought out by a new company. And, um, and that's why all the healthcare was changing so much. But he lost his job. And then he ended up staying home with the kid. And then I had to find a job to work. And it was interesting because there was a church job that came along and I would turn it down one time. And I was like, no, I want to work in legal. I want to work in the law office. And it came around again when this happened. And so I was like, crap, I need it. I can't, I can't, I have to take it. And it was there that um, here I was as a transitional coordinator of administration and communication. Um, I was not going to church at the time. And so I was working at this church. The interim had fired his staff. Um, I was basically in charge of the whole entire church. Um, there was a nonprofit they were bringing in. I was trying to get um, work that out between her and the, the nonprofit and the board and work with those relationships. Um, and that happened for two years. So I was that as a part time for two years, uh, made twenty twenty dollars, which seems like seems good. Twenty dollars an hour. But I was doing uh, everything from website to copyright to doing all their marketing campaigns for zero dollar budget. Um, and then also doing their logos, just everything. And then also doing the church secretary job on top of that. And then making sure, and then just being sort of like this liaison for all the different um, areas. <laughs> and I did that for two years. I tried to leave that job. Um, I did what I did with the other one. I was like, you know, I've been here for about a year and a half, promote me or I'm out of here. <laughs> Because it was taking so long for them to find our senior pastor. They had gone through three interim ministers at that time, which was amazing because I loved working with every single one of them. And it was that experience with each of them. One of them was an emeritus professor of history, which was awesome. Um, and he was like 80. And he just, he was, he, he spoke his mind. <laughs> and that was really interesting to be like, can you say that you're a pastor? <laughs> but um, so um that was going on. And I was like, promote me, I'm out of here. And then my spleen topples over just randomly. And I felt like, oh my God. <laughs> so I had to stay until they found their senior pastor. And um, that surgery from that, I had splenectomy. And that surgery from that gave me blood clots. It's like, oh, crap, I had three blood clots. And now I'm at this church that's like 70s and 80 year olds um, pr uh, predominantly. And I'm sharing, they're, they're telling me their like blood thinner story and I can relate. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'm so old. <laughs> So my whole community, my whole social life was just gone. I, you know, new mom, don't really have a lot of friends anymore I'm out of my whole entire work industry. I did. Um, but they didn't, they didn't keep me at that church. And it was interesting because we did find another church. We had to find because we had, had a kid and we wanted to get her back into the church. And so we found this one that was sort of like a sign because the um, residential pastor was the pastor who married us at, um, in, at, a church from way like far away and he was there as the residential pastor and then the music director was my husband's old music teacher um and she was like from far away <laughs> and so it was like all these little oh my gosh we need to be here but it was interesting because the church that i was at and the church the new one that i was at 
they both had a storm, uh, a stewardship problem, two different ones. One had, um, you know, gone through this, this change and this, this had a little bit of toxicity and just, um, a lot of frustration and what was going on, but they had the people who were willing to come out. They just didn't have enough people. The other one had a lot of people, but they did not have participation. You know, they had like the 20% doing everything, the 80% not doing anything. I went to this um, campaign they had, it was called um, Spark. And I wasn't really gonna be involved and I just went to the meeting and it was like the first meeting, I missed the first meeting. The second meeting, they're still arguing about getting started. I was like, seriously? (laughs) Why are we arguing about getting started? What's going on? So I kind of spoke up and I kind of took, you know, here's, I I mapped out something. I was like, okay, here's how we're gonna do it. And everybody liked it. It It's like, cause they were just trying to figure out what to call it, which was Spark, which was where it came from. And it's like, well, here's what we'll do. And this is what's going to happen. And this, 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 and that night we got everything done. And here I am, I got promoted to chair of this committee. It was only supposed to be like this mindset change committee. Um, and I had given them five words, um, respect. Um, what is it? Respect, responsibility, engage, partner, commit. And if you do those five words, then you're going to have that unity in the church. And it kind of presents you, puts you in that mindset frame that you can see that God is already working your church with what you have. The whole core of it was, was stewardship of we give because God gives us the ability to give. And when we give, we are thanking God for giving us that ability to give. So it takes the guilt, the guilt compulsion off of giving. They turned it into a financial campaign, a stewardship financial campaign. They didn't see the money. They dropped it. So I was like, great. So I was out of that one church. The other church did not want to really have anything to do with what I was trying to do. So I was like, you know what? I've worked at these other places. All they've given me is an outdated computer. I have done all this work for them. And these jack of all trades, a jack of all specialists, jack of all everything. It's like, what happens if I build a company and just do it all myself? So that's where the idea of my company came from. So my entire life journey that, that I've told you is what has shaped redesign your thinking. And those five words you will find integrated throughout the entire company. The thing I love about Christ and and why I'm a Christian is that he's this rebel. You know, he's this guy who went to all the traditions that they had, all these religious traditions, and he broke every single one. He's like, oh, that rule? Oh, I'm God. Here, let me, let me, I'm not supposed to work on Sunday. Oh, watch this. I'm going to perform a miracle. What are you going to do about it? You know, and it's like, you can't do anything about it because I'm God. And, you know, he really ticked off the religious people. <laughs> you know, but this is, this is Jesus. This is, this is the guy who like, I love. And um, so, yeah. And, and, and the thing is with my, my company, my company is my 100% faith mission. I am taking that company. I, I turned it over to God and I said, God, your love and grace is missing in this world. We need to bring it back. And I wanted to have a company that that empowered people, brought hope, gave them a place that they could have these conversations. Because I believe in those conversations, the stereotypes that keep us apart get destroyed. And we find out there's far much more we have in common with each other than the things that keep us apart. So that's the journey of my faith. That is the entire reason why I created my company and why it is the way it is. Now you've got a little bit more insight into the podcast stuff and more about me. And I tell you, everything is costume for me. Everything is theater for me. There is no difference between something I've made for, you know, Halloween for my daughter. You know, this is my husband's um, gecko costume that she wanted to be outlet. And so I made him a little gecko mask. There's nothing different than this or burlesque. You know, it's all costume. It's all about emotional response. It's all about, you know, a passion and the arts. And it doesn't matter what form of the arts it is. Arts is about soliciting an emotional response. Arts is about passion. And I think, you know, religion should be about passion too. It should be about making people happy and, and showing that love and bringing that love and showing what grace is. That's what you're going to find with my company. That's what you're going to find with me. And sometimes I do things that get me in trouble. I'm an artist. I'm a rebel. You know, I'm not conventional. I'm not going to follow the social norms. And I love doing what I love doing. And I'm going to do my art any way that I can. And so I built a company so I can do my art, be an artist, 
and I can teach as much as I want and I can teach whatever I want. And I don't have to worry about any grades. I don't have to worry about any kind of person telling me that I need to be doing this or that I have to follow some kind of government structure. And if I'm called indoctrination, I don't care because Socrates was, and he ended up shaping the political science. So indoctrination must be good. If you want free thinking, if you want rebel, if you want anything like that, then you're going to find it with me because I don't, I don't follow the rules and I don't break the law. I'm a stickler for the law and I'm stickler for policy. But when it comes to social norms and those kind of rules, I break them all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing I love about Socrates, I've read um, Plato is the fact that he's like this man who's just kind of, there was a scene in Socrates where he's, um, He's in Plato, where they talk about him being in front of a vacant uh, door frame, and he's just carrying on this discourse to a vacant building in a door frame. And I feel like that sometimes, you know. <laughs> I don't know who listens to me. I don't know if anyone listens to me, but I feel like Socrates. Like I have all this stuff I want to share, all this insight, and I will. And I don't know if I'm just, you know, this old, this old man is like babbling in front of a, a door frame. But I felt like such a Ken trip a kinship to Socrates. <laughs> and that's what you're going to find also with my company. Like every single rebel that's been out there, every revolutionist out there is, is sort of integrated into my company, the inspiration of them. So it's definitely a revolutionary company. It's a revolution. It's a global revolution. It's a shadow revolution. It's a woman's revolution. It's an arts revolution. It's whatever I want to call it because I'm a theater engineer and it's constantly morphing to be whatever I want it to be because it's art. <laughs> that's who I am. So now you've got a little bit more insight. Now you see, you know, <laughs> I am dorky. I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a dork. I'm a geek. And I love it. I don't care. And, you know, it's from that burlesque experience that I got that confidence because I didn't have that confidence before. And honestly, I think every woman out there should take burlesque just to have that experience, that empowerment, and really see the power that you really do have. All right. That's it. <laughs>